Hey guys, it's your favorite reliability test guy here with another fun-filled action-packed video on reliability test and validation topics. This current video is on mechanical shock testing. I hope you enjoy this video and if you do, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching and let's get started. This video is an introduction to mechanical shock testing. How to plan, select, and execute a mechanical shock test. In this video, we will discuss definitions, physics of mechanical shock, types of mechanical shock tests, mechanical shock test selection, and how to perform or execute a mechanical shock test. Below is a high-level summary that illustrates the process from requirements to test results and test reporting. We will cover a topic on test execution today in regards to shock testing. Let's start off by defining what the word shock means in terms of physics. Shock is a sudden or drastic and short duration change from an equilibrium state. Some examples of this include thermal shock, which is a sudden drastic change in temperature. An object is shocked when a sudden change in temperature occurs, but will eventually stabilize at the new ambient temperature and achieve equilibrium once more after a period of time. An example of this is taking an object that is sitting in a heated warm house and dropping it into a bucket of ice water. Another form of shock is mechanical shock, which is a sudden, short-duration transient mechanical energy which is transferred into an object or system. We will go over mechanical shock in more detail in the next slide. Another example is acoustical shock, which is a sudden and extreme propagation of air pressure. An example of this is is the instantaneous movement of air from an ordnance blast that you can hear a sound from the change in air pressure or if you're really unlucky physically feel the acoustic shock wave if you are within a close proximity to feel a higher amount of air pressure before it has time to travel and dissipate. The last type of shock from a physics perspective is electromagnetic shock which is a sudden release and propagation of electromagnetic energy. Some examples of this type of event are a solar flare or a detonation of a nuclear weapon. Let's go ahead and discuss mechanical shock testing now in more detail. Mechanical shock testing is a simulated transient mechanical event in which mechanical energy is transmitted or propagated throughout a system or product. Some real world examples of mechanical shock are environmentally induced mechanical shocks such as with potholes as a vehicle moves across a surface or a short duration jolt from a earthquake. Another example is a impact or bump type shock such as a system or package getting dropped during handling. Also, a vehicle crash event, or a cart rolling down an inclined slope and colliding with a wall, or perhaps a bullet fired and impacting an object, or even a bell that is struck and rung. These are examples of impact or bump type shocks. Another example is pyrotechnic events also which produce mechanical shock, such as a bomb detonation or a rocket stage separation, or even a airbag deploying. In this video, we will cover elements of environmentally induced and impact mechanical shock pulses and the equipment used for simulating these real world scenarios. Let's go ahead and briefly discuss the physics of mechanical shock on systems. A critical parameter that you need to understand for your system is how shock waves propagate through your system or structure. Understanding the direction of the energy, the system's mass, the materials used for the system, the thickness and rigidity of the system, and the system damping 
will allow you to assess the amplitude of the shock wave, how quickly the energy will decay or dissipate as it travels through your system, and the impact of the stress from the shock wave, such as immediate damage, fatigue, and overall functional or structural system degradation. Mechanical energy enters a system in the form of a mechanical impulse and leaves the system as thermal energy. As we learned in school, the first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only change form. When you see an object move, displace or oscillate, and then come to a stop, the energy didn't just disappear or die or fly off into an alternate universe where energy magically goes. Nope, the energy simply is changing form and dissipates as heat from the system until all of the energy has changed its form from mechanical energy to thermal energy via friction. Likewise, thermal energy can be utilized to com and converted to perform mechanical work as an example to the right, or with a steam-powered locomotive or boat. All objects and things experience friction. The only time friction would not exist is in a vacuum. For instance, consider a space vehicle that enters the Earth's atmosphere. The sudden exposure of a space vehicle to the higher density molecules produces intense friction, which causes the exterior of the space vehicle to interact with the fluid and release energy in the form of heat. Another example of this that many of us have experienced is the sensation of resistance you feel when you jump off of a diving board into a swimming pool. The sudden change in molecular density from a gaseous air molecules to water molecules can instantly be felt and dependent on the angle and speed that you enter can cause injury or death. Friction can be an enemy but its power can be harnessed to do good in the world of system mechanics in the form of damping. This can be done through an increase of mass of the system or through the decoupling of the system from an external mechanical input or inputs using materials with a higher damping ratio to reduce or completely remove the mechanical wave from entering the system. The image shows the signals of an undamped versus damped system. Notice how the peak amplitude of the red system is significantly higher than the blue and green systems. As you can see, the energy decays and eventually comes to rest or equilibrium. However, it's the initial amplitude peaks that you will want to reduce for your system. An analogy for the impact of density or stiffness and the mass of the system requires you to look at your own stomach. If you are blessed and born with rock hard abs, then you may not know what I'm talking about here. But for the majority of us, when you give your stomach a good tap, you can visually see the deformity and movement and ripples as the energy waves propagate across your belly. On the other hand, if you have a muscular midsection and give it a good tap, there isn't much, if any, movement. The reason for this is that your abdomen is primarily comprised of denser muscle cells, while someone with a belly has an abdomen composition that has more fat cells. Muscle is denser and heavier and has a much higher spring constant than looser, lighter fat cells. Speaking of springs, let's take a look at the good old spring mass system. Any engineer should be able to recognize and understand what a spring mass system is. The strategy here is to either increase mass or dampen for your system to reduce the amplitude and restrain or reduce modal motion for your system. Using the engineering approach that was intelligently drilled into us in school, we need to break up our predicted system dynamics into smaller parts in order to understand our design and solve and fix any issues. As a good structural engineer would know, breaking up a complex system and its dynamic motion into individual spring mass components for each part of the system allows you to determine the material and mechanical properties such as dampen, spring coefficients, and mass for each part of your system, allowing you to understand the amount of energy that will dissipate and how much modal movement will take place for your system. The name of the game in mechanical design is to minimize the initial amplitude, which is accomplished through reducing, 
and restrained modes, which is done using dampen to reduce energy or through additional bracing and support to keep the part within your system from flexing or severely moving or by increasing mass. You want to design your system such that it smoothly transitions back to equilibrium using an intelligently planned out mechanical design. To summarize this point, you want to minimize the amplitude of the waves, ensure the propagation path avoids sensitive components of the system, and gracefully dissipate the mechanical energy from the system. A great example of creating a desired mechanical energy propagation path is in the design of an automotive vehicle. Notice that there are two things going on in this crash simulation. The vehicle body crumbles, which creates friction and helps remove energy from the system in the form of heat. Also notice that the driver's door seems to push out, which provides a visual example of the majority of the wave propagation moving through the driver's side door instead of through the person driving the vehicle. That would be bad news if all that energy traveled directly through you. Ouch! One more quick note before we move on is that the mechanical shock excites all resonant frequencies of the system as the shock wave propagates through the system and in turn excites all the modes of the system. I define resonant frequency or natural frequency in my video on vibration testing. However, let's quickly define what resonant or natural frequency is. Resonant or natural frequency is the frequency at which an object becomes excited and oscillates independently from the driving mechanical input. A great example of this is a tuning fork, which when tapped audibly rings and mechanically oscillates at the resonant frequency of that particular tuning fork. Going back to the spring mass example, changing the mass or spring coefficient of your system will change the natural frequency at which your system responds. A change in dampen for your system will reduce the amplitude of the resonance and widen the width of the resonance. Let's take a look at an example of a single degree of freedom spring mass system to visually help us understand resonance. We are going to perform a quick exercise. We will count the number of oscillations or cycles for this single degree of freedom system over a 10 second period. We will then divide the number of cycles by 10 seconds, which will give us a natural or resonant frequency of the single degree of freedom system in this example, in hertz as expressed in the equation to the right. Let's get started. As you can see, we have a total number of 10 cycles for the 10 second period for this single degree of freedom system. Let's go ahead and plug these values into the equation we had defined just now. Let's go ahead and solve. And we have found the natural frequency of this single degree of freedom system which is one cycle per second or one hertz. Pretty cool, eh? No! Well, go back to your Fortnite tutorials and let the rest of us have loads of fun learning about mechanical shock and mechanical physics. I scoured the internet looking for a video on a reed tachometer to demonstrate what happens from a mechanical shock event and where you could actually visually see all the resonant frequencies being excited simultaneously. Unfortunately, I did not have any luck finding any shock read tachometer examples. Let's go ahead and define what a read tachometer is. A read tachometer is a measurement tool with small reads of varying masses. In the case of sine vibration, the read with the natural frequency of the input sine vibration will begin to move. If you tap the side of a read tachometer, all of the reeds would begin to move simultaneously, which is what shock does. To understand what I'm talking about here, let's watch a video that I was able to find of a reed tachometer pressed up against a vibrating machine. As you can see, 
the read with the mass and the vibrating frequency of the machine begins to oscillate in response to the transmitted vibration. Pretty cool, huh? Now that I finished putting you to sleep with a Physics 101 refresher course, let's learn about some of the types of mechanical shock events that are simulated using different shock test systems and strategies used to verify and validate system robustness. The first type are the classical shock pulses. We have the half sign, the terminal peak sawtooth, and the trapezoid. The main parameters to keep in mind are the amplitude or G's peak, the pulse duration, which is typically expressed in milliseconds, and the pulse direction. For the pulse direction, you need to determine do you want to run this test in the positive direction, negative direction, or both directions for your test. So what do I mean by positive and negative directions? Well, typically, a system's axes and directions are defined with what is called a axis definition. Here is an example of an axis definition. You have a defined x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis, and their corresponding positive directions. The opposite of these directions would be your negative directions. So for this example, these were determined as the normal operating orientation for this particular system, which is widget XYZ. In other words, what is meant by positive and negative direction is that the positive direction is the normal direction of the object's defined orientation, moving with the direction of gravity. Or for the negative direction, it is the opposite direction of the object's defined orientation, moving with the direction of gravity. In the case of a mechanical shock test performed on an electrodynamic shaker, which we will discuss and define in the next slide, the positive direction is when the object moves towards the driving body of the shaker. And the negative direction is when your test sample moves away from the driving body of the shaker. Many years ago, before I was born and during the age of dinosaurs, Classical shock pulses were originally used for testing due to the limitations of the test equipment at the time, which was limited to mechanical shock drop towers. Today, there are better simulations of mechanical shock testing out there, which consist of a process of instrumenting your system with accelerometers and operating the system under various field and usage conditions. The field data that you collect would then be used to generate either a field time replication shock transient profile or you could take that time domain data and create an envelope shock test of the maximum accelerations assuming a series of single degree of freedom systems in the shock response spectrum expressed in the frequency domain converted from the time domain data. Many industries and companies still use classical shock pulses to perform both reliability and validation testing. The reason for this is that classical shock is what they may have utilized for decades and are slow to adopt more realistic forms of shock testing. Likewise with many of the test centers out there, newer companies will even adopt classical shock pulses because that is what's utilized in a lot of the current test standards for different industries. However, I'm not saying you should never use classical shock tests, as it may be necessary for early development and verification testing, especially if you do not have the ability to get representative field data and need to get learnings on your initial design before moving into field testing and the ability to acquire field data. Classical shock is a good quick and dirty method to make sure that your system has some level of robustness and does not fall apart or break from mechanical shock input. Keep in mind though, I do want you to take heed and caution in using classical shock pulses to determine field reliability for your system or product. Let's go ahead and take a look at mechanical shock testing in the shock response spectrum. Shock response spectrum or SRS, is a method to replicate time transient shock data at an acceleration level believed to cause degradation or damage to the system and present the transient shock graphically in the frequency domain. 
you assume and model for a series of damped single degree of freedom systems that have the same dampened to a transient shock event and modeled to the maximum possible or peak acceleration to represent how your system would respond to the same mechanical shock transient. SRS is used primarily for pyroshock and earthquake simulations. However, other types of transients can be converted and expressed as an SRS. The shock response spectrum axes consist of the peak or maximum acceleration in the vertical axis, as you can see on the graph, versus the natural frequencies of a series of assumed single degree of freedom systems in the horizontal axis, as you can see on the graph as well which are all assumed to have the same level of dampen to the same acceleration input. The key parameters to keep in mind when setting up your SRS profile are the SRS generation type that you want to use. Some examples include burst, envelope random, linear, and exponential chirp. The type of shock event you are trying to replicate will drive the decision and selection of the SRS generation type. You also need to consider the quality factor, expressed as Q on the graph, or the dampen ratio, whichever is required by the test system that you're using to generate your SRS pulse. The quality factor expresses the lack of friction or the lack of dampen for a single degree of freedom system. It expresses the width and peak of the resonance frequency. The higher the Q factor, the nearer and the higher the amplitude is for the shock response at that resonant frequency. Likewise, the dampen ratio expresses the amount of dampen or friction the single degree of freedom system has and determines how quickly the single degree of freedom system comes to rest after a transient shock input into the system. The signal measurement strategy is also something you need to consider for the SRS spectrum. You can decide to use MaxiMax, which is the maximum positive and negative accelerations for the transient and is typically used for SRS testing. But you can also use max positive and max negative as well. You also need to define the natural frequency breakpoints and peak accelerations for the single degree of freedom systems. You are assuming that all the single degree of freedom systems that you are modeling for your SRS profile have the same dampen to the excitation shock acceleration input. The key parameters that define the resonance of a single degree of freedom system are to determined by the mass of the system, the spring coefficient, and the damping coefficient. Changing any of these parameters by using a different spring or different mass for your single degree of freedom system will change the resonant frequency. The synthesis method you want to use for the base input waveform is also something you need to consider. Damp sine waves are commonly used. Also, the half fractional octave spacing, which defines the resolution for your SRS graph and determines how the frequencies for the SRS envelope are divided out. When you synthesize your SRS pulse, you get a table of wavelets. The wavelets are a series of sine waves used to produce the SRS pulse for your shock test. The pitfalls that you need to keep in mind for SRS is that it does not provide all the original content of the captured transient time waveform, as SRS only looks at the peak accelerations. What this means is you can take a totally different transient shock waveform and end up generating a similar SRS curve. So keep that in mind when considering SRS testing. Next up is field replicated shock pulse profiles. The shock data you end up with can have many different shapes and characteristics that depend on how your system behaves from a transient shock input and how and where the shock input is induced into your system. Settings in your data acquisition system can also affect how the data is presented graphically, such as the filtering you use and the sampling rate that you set for your data acquisition system. Collect and fill data is a fun project to work on as you get to escape from your desk and sometimes your office to collect field data. How cool is that? So how do we go about collecting transient shock data in the field? The first thing you need is to gather up your instrumentation. 
At a minimum, you will need an accelerometer and a data acquisition system. Additional items needed all depend on what type of data accelerometer and data acquisition system you use. In the case of an accelerometer, you need to determine what the mounting strategy is that you will need to use for your system or product, which will drive the selection of the type of accelerometer you will use. Here are the three of the primary types of accelerometers that can be used. The first type is a stud or bolt mountain type accelerometer. In this example, we have a stud mount accelerometer, but there are also through hole types that will allow you to run a bolt or bolts through your accelerometer to the attachment points on your system. These bad boys thread into a threaded location on your system and are the best solution to use whenever possible as it gives you the best connection to your system and is the least likely mountain strategy out of the three that we will discuss to pop off during data collecting or field testing. However, your mountain location may not be threaded or you may have a very small device and you want to minimize the amount of mass that you add to the system you're testing. If you only have stud type accelerometers on hand, however, and need to attach using adhesive, do yourself a favor and get some adapter pads. If you apply adhesive directly to the mating surface of your accelerometer, you can get the adhesive into the threads for the mountain stud and create a nightmare for yourself in the future when you want to use the accelerometer with a mountain stud. It always frustrates me when some idiot engineer or technician gets lazy and globs adhesive directly onto the bottom of a stud type accelerometer and clogs up the threads. The adapter pads are super cheap, so do yourself a favor and have some on hand. Tell your cheap boss that these things will not hurt his department cost savings bonus and that he needs to release the purse strings for a couple of bucks to get some of these on hand. The next type of accelerometer is the adhesive mountain type accelerometer. These accelerometers have a smooth flat surface for placing adhesive for attaching your accelerometer to the desired location on your system. The last attachment option is a magnetic accelerometer or magnetic stud mount adapter that you can attach to a stud mount accelerometer and turn it into a magnetic mount accelerometer. They have integrated fixed magnets for attaching to magnetically compatible metal surfaces. To be quite frank, in most cases and applications, these things are terrible. They pop off really easy and you may not notice that the accelerometer has decoupled from your test surface until you have completed collecting your data. I recommend avoid magnetic attachment type accelerometers whenever possible. For the data acquisition system or DAC, you need to consider items that you will need to support the system such as a power source, if the DAC does not have an internal battery, a laptop, if the DAC does not have means of storage such as an internal hard drive or a flash drive or SD card slot. In regards to the test system you use to reproduce the transient shock data you collected for your system in the field, you should look at a test system offering that has a controller that will allow you to load the transient time data file or CSV produced by your DAC. So keep that in mind when purchasing test equipment for shock testing and field shock data reproduction. These are a few things to keep in mind when you are preparing to collect and reproduce field shock data. If you need help collecting field data or collecting a corresponding transient shock test profile, feel free to reach out to me in one of the links in the description to see how I can help or provide additional training. The last type of shock test is impact. This is typically a test that causes a physical impact directly to the system or an impact to a fixture that the system is attached to in order to transmit a high transient into the system through the impact fixture. Here are a few examples of an impact shock test. The first is a pendulum impact shock test. The amount of energy transmitted into your system depends on the weight of the pendulum and the height at which the pendulum is released. The second type is an incline impact test. 
In this test, you have a wheeled platform or cart that rolls down an incline and slams your package, crate, or system into a wall. This is a really fun test and I hope you get to try this or witness this test at some point in your career. The amount of force that transmits into your system depends on the weight of your package, crate, or system, the slope of the incline, and the height at which you release your system from the incline. Another impact test is a vehicle crash test. This is cool and awesome to see. You can take the data you collected from this test to produce shock tests for components within your vehicle that can be reproduced on an electrodynamic shock test system. A great way to make sure things like brackets and mounts don't break off and send flying projectiles towards the driver, passenger, or someone nearby a vehicle during a crash event is to collect data from a mule or some other test prototype vehicle and take in that data to create a profile that you would run on an electrodynamic shaker. We'll define what an electrodynamic shaker is shortly. I showed you some of the physical test setups for impact testing. Let's discuss quickly the test equipment that can be used for a classical shock pulses, SRS, and transient shock time replication. Producing classical shock pulses can be done with the following two types of test setups. The first shock test equipment that could be used is a mechanical shock tower. A mechanical shock tower is typically used to produce half sine shock pulses using different durometer materials to produce your half sine pulse width. Materials typically used are silicone rubber, felt, and even cork board. You can also get an option on some shock tower systems that includes a pressurized piston as the impact surface to produce trapezoidal pulses. You can even produce sawtooth pulses by using lead cones to create the sawtooth shape. Classical shock pulses can also be generated using an electrodynamic shaker. I go into a lot of detail about electrodynamic shakers in my vibration theory and application part 1 video. However, a brief description of an electrodynamic shaker is that it is a giant loudspeaker and has an armature and a field coil that produces mechanical energy via current moving perpendicular to a magnetic field. Electrodynamic shakers have their limitations and drawbacks, however, as it is limited by the amount of displacement, velocity, and acceleration it can produce, while mechanical shock towers typically allow you to produce higher pulse width durations or acceleration levels that you could not produce on an electrodynamic system. Electrodynamic shakers are also used for generating SRS shock tests and for reproducing transient shock pulses as well. Electrodynamic shakers have far more capabilities and applications than a mechanical shock tower. However, make sure you understand the limitations of your electrodynamic shaker so you don't break your system if a safety limit fails or look like an idiot in front of your boss when you tell him you can run a test and later find out that you cannot. Alrighty, now we are ready to learn about how to perform a shock test. You have endured this entire video for this glorious moment. Pointer number one is to understand the transient and shock profile that you are trying to generate. Are you trying to reproduce an environmental shock event such as a pothole, an impact event, or perhaps a pyrotechnic event? You need to understand your system, the potential use cases, and corner cases, and your customer and system requirements. If you are the one deciding what shock events to simulate, Make it a priority to collect field data to reproduce on an electrodynamic shaker. This is the most effective method for gauging system robustness to mechanical shock. If you don't have the luxury and need to use a profile from a test standard, make sure you are using an industry-specific standard that has profiles created from field data on systems that are similar to your system and industry. If you collect field data, you can accelerate mechanical shock fatigue by determining an acceleration factor that is a higher shock level or you can literally run the predicted number of shock pulses that were determined to occur throughout the life of your system in the field. Be careful if you are considering applying an acceleration factor to a shock profile from a test standard. 
As you may not know if this profile already has an acceleration factor applied to it or not. Unless explicitly stated that the shock profile is not accelerated in some shape or form, do not try to create an accelerated shock test profile using a shock profile from a test standard. Which brings us to number two, which is to make sure your shock profile represents the system and corner cases for your industry and how the customer will use your system in the field. Don't arbitrarily pick a shock profile because you found a random shock test on a web search. Try to get field data for a mechanical shock reproduction from your system or at a minimum use an industry and system specific test profile. Tip number three is to select the appropriate accelerometer for your tests. We went over mountain types already, so I won't put you through that again. However, you need to also look at the performance parameters of the accelerometer, such as the sensitivity, the dynamic range and response, and the temperature range for your accelerometer. You can get this information from the data sheet for your accelerometer that you have on hand and make sure that it will work. In the case of sensitivity, selecting an accelerometer with the sensitivity that is too large will cause the accelerometer to get saturated and produce a clipped signal. On the other hand, selecting an accelerometer with a sensitivity that is too low can produce an undesired response and has a more limited dynamic range. You also need to know the temperature range that your accelerometer can perform under especially in the case where you will be performing the shock test along with a temperature simulation or collecting field data in a high temperature or low temperature environment. Using an accelerometer outside of its operational range can cause erroneous readings, cause the accelerometer to stop functioning, or even damage the accelerometer. So keep this important and easily overlooked parameter in mind. Okay, on to the next tip, which is shock fixture design. Fixtures can have all shapes and sizes. A lot of companies use the same fixtures for vibration and shock testing. This is okay if the fixture was optimized for both vibration and shock testing for your system. There are many times when a good vibration fixture is absolutely terrible for shock. The reason for this is that dynamics and amplitudes are drastically different between vibe and shock mechanical inputs. For one thing, shock typically has a higher peak acceleration level. Also, the vibration fixture could have been optimized for a frequency range for a vibration test profile and not for the frequency and response generated by the shock profile. Pictured is an angle bracket, a square plate, and a round plate, and a cube. The angle bracket fixture is great for capturing X, Y, and Z axes when the shaker is in the horizontal orientation, as you can move both the fixture and the test sample to collect all and capture all three axes. However, I've rarely seen this successfully accomplished for shock, especially at peak acceleration levels above 30 Gs. You have to really know what you're doing here as a mechanical engineer and know the relationship between the response from the shock input and the angle and thickness of the gussets. Gussets are the angled support on the fixture as pictured. The second example is the square plate, which works but should be avoided for both vibration and shock if possible, especially with larger plates and higher acceleration levels. The reason for this is you can end up with locations that have a node. A node occurs when you have mechanical wave propagations of different phases that intersect and cancel each other out. This results in point locations where you have zero displacement, velocity, and acceleration as the opposing waves cancel each other out. On a square fixture, this typically occurs in the center area of the fixture, where your test sample is mounted. This is no bueno, my friend. This is where round fixtures are great if one fits your test sample and your shaker or shock tower. Round fixtures avoid the issue of node locations, which makes them perfect for dynamic tests. So keep that in mind. The last example is a cube. These things are awesome. Depending on the size of your test sample, 
as you can use this bad boy with the shaker in the vertical axis, eliminating the weight of the slip table, which is the plate that slides on your shaker in the horizontal axis, and the bullnose or drive comb, which is the adapter that attaches your shaker armature to the slip plate. However, you can use a cube fixture in the horizontal axis on a slip table if that floats your boat. But I don't know why people and companies would want to do this, but they do. Cubes have their potential drawbacks, however, as they can add significant weight for your shaker to push. You can make bores in your cube, but this can cause undesired ringing and resonances. You can design a workaround for this by filling the board holes with a vibration and shock dampened foam, but this can get expensive. Cubes are very expensive to purchase as well from a fixture design house, and a lot of engineers do not design these bad boys correctly. So keep costs, weight, and design pitfalls in mind when using a cube. Vibration and shock fixtures are typically made with either magnesium or aluminum. Magnesium is the way to go, as it is softer and lighter, but still robust as compared to aluminum. Magnesium fixtures do a great job of transmitting mechanical energy without increasing the amplitude of an input signal, as compared to aluminum, which can cause ringing, which means you have resonances, which cause a higher than desired shock or vibration response amplitude, or even affect the control of the shock or vibration test. To get minimal response or good transmissibility with aluminum, you'd have to go with a much thicker and heavier material than an equivalent magnesium fixture. Magnesium, however, is much more expensive than aluminum and can be dangerous to cut and drill, as magnesium dust is highly flammable and burns so hot the combustion of magnesium is invisible to the naked eye. However, whenever possible, try to build your fixture using magnesium material. Minimize the number of maiden interfaces between your test sample and the shaker. Don't be lazy or an idiot and stack a bunch of plates on top of each other. This causes a phenomenon called decoupling, which causes a higher response and transmissibility ratio, meaning your input signal will get amplified when it reaches your system. And that's it! These pointers will give you a major head start in planning and executing your mechanical shock test. The key takeaways from this video are, know your system, industry, and customer requirements. Don't choose a shock profile from a test standard or Google search arbitrarily. If you do not know the application or purpose of the identified shock test profile that you found online. Create a mechanical shock profile from field data. Cookie cutter profiles are good for initial testing, but you want to tailor your shock profile specifically to your product using field collected data. You really need to think about the accelerometer you will use, its sensitivity, temperature range, and so forth, and the mountain type you want or need for your tests. You also need to tailor your fixture design for shock testing such that you get minimal response and a transmissibility as close to 1 to 1 ratio as possible, which means a pass through of an input shock transient rather than amplifying the signal before the mechanical energy propagates to your test sample or system. Shock testing is important for almost every different type of system or product and industry, so don't screw it up and plan ahead of time on what you will do and what you are trying to accomplish. If you need help with developing your shock tests and determining your test equipment and shock test setup, feel free to reach out to me at one of the links in the description. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me at one of the links below. Thanks for watching and have a great day.